So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kim Matheson, and I'm the Vice President of Research and International at Carleton University, for those of you who don't know me. And welcome to this afternoon's annual Davidson Dunton Research Lecture. This lecture was established in 1983 in memory of one of Carleton's longest standing um, presidents, Davidson Dutton. The lecture is intended to give us an opportunity to invite a distinguished Carleton faculty member to share their research findings both with the Carleton community and with the community beyond, and to give you a sense of the kinds of exciting work that we do on the campus. This year's um, distinguished lecturer is Professor Paul Keane, who is a professor in the Department of English and is also the chair of the department. And Paul was nominated by a faculty member to do this talk, and I think that the committee was as impressed by the passion and affection in the nomination uh, regarding um, Paul as it was by your own credentials. But this is a really important thing because, in fact, what we're looking for is a scholar who isn't just somebody who sits in the library and writes and reads, but also is connected to the faculty, connected to the students, and connected to the institution. And Paul certainly exemplifies each of those characteristics. So he's also an internationally known and renowned scholar. Um, he's very well published and has been consistently supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities um, Federation. His research, and the research I believe you're talking about tonight, concerns the print culture of Romantic and 18th century periods. And in his most recent work, he was, he's been exploring a large array of authors from across the 18th, the 18th century and their responses um, to an era of commercial and social change. The, these changes forced people living in Britain to ask themselves many questions, including what types of writing mattered in a prosperous commercial nation, and what kinds of knowledge should literature offer if it was going to be relevant during its time. As we go through our own technological and social changes as a society, I think these, in que these questions are important to ask and to learn from previous times. His book, which is describing this work called The Age of Authors, an Anthology of 18th Century Print Culture, I believe is going to be released later this year by Broadview Press. So this afternoon, Dr. Keene is going to talk to us about, hey, the title's right here, Hanging by a Thread, Social Media and Literature Value in a London Field. Do you mean a real field? Yeah. August 1754. Paul. Uh, thank you for that, Kim, and thanks for coming out. Uh, I want to begin by saying a special thank you to a, a colleague who, who did take the time on what always feels for all of us like too busy a day to, uh, to, to write the nomination letter. I, I appreciated that generosity. And thank you to the selection committee who are obviously far too easily persuaded by it. So thank you. Uh, while I was thinking about uh, what to say today, and I saw Tim Pitchell earlier, and I think Tim would use the technical word procrastinating. Uh, I, I found myself fairly late one night or, or early one morning trying to uh, reinstall my Netscape Messenger. That's that program that allows you to have the email equivalent of, of conference calls. Uh, I wasn't aware that I'd ever uninstalled my Netscape Messenger, but my computer seemed to have fairly strong feelings about it. So I'm going through the process of, of reinstalling it. Uh, and at one point uh, in this process, um, uh, one of those, you know, sort of vaguely psychedelic kind of twisted line of impossible to read letters showed up on the screen. And the message showed up on the screen saying, uh, can you please type these letters in, as it put it, uh, to help us prove that you are human. Uh, this seemed a bit ironic coming from my computer, uh, especially at that time of night. But uh, I cooperated, as you do in these situations, and, and, and typed in the letters, uh, only to be told uh, twice, actually, that I had failed uh, in, my, in my effort to prove my humanity to my computer. So, uh, and so this got me thinking you know, about the whole philosophical tradition that is bound up with that endeavor. How do we prove 
that we're human. Uh, and you know, from Descartes' determination to go right back to first principles, I think, therefore I am, to, to, to radical enlightenment skeptics like David Hume who question whether it's possible to know anything, uh, a position which I have to say I was adopting by that point of the night, but uh, uh, to you know, sort of existentialists like Sartre. And, and, and then this, this gave way to, um, to a far more profound and kind of sad realization that in some ways this was a defining moment that epitomized the whole of my academic career. Uh, and not just my career, uh, and not even just, I think, an, an enduring preoccupation within English studies right from its beginnings, but, but something that men and women have been wrestling with for thousands of years. Not exclusively how to download their Netscape Messenger, but uh, how, how do we engage with technologies of writing, and especially in periods of radical technological change, how do we engage with technologies in writing in ways that seem to affirm or enhance our humanity rather than to uh, alienate or undermine it? How do we use the machinery of writing uh, without becoming part of the machine? Uh, there are very, very few things more highly mythologized than the power of the printed word. As, as, as Christian Thorne has put it, I'm going to have to figure out how to hold these papers, it is a story so familiar that it nearly tells itself. Europe was once full of imbeciles. Then came the printing press, and there were imbeciles no more. For with print came mass literacy, and with literacy came learning, and with learning, it is here that the story gets hazy, came democratic self-fulfillment in some form or other. This is a story, then, of lettered nations and lettered subjects. And it is a story that we have been telling ourselves for centuries. As Isaac Disraeli put it in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, the taste for books, so rare before the 15th century, has gradually become general only within these 400 years. In that small space of time, the public mind of Europe has been created. The public mind of Europe, uh, a collective consciousness that was unprecedented and unthinkable, he suggests, without the printing press, which has conjured this public into, into existence. And as Thorne suggests, these, uh, the description of this narrative, the deployment of this narrative, are often overtly political. In, uh, in late 1788, so just months before the outbreak of the French Revolution, the literary magazine, the Analytical Review, announced, quote, if there are circumstances which invariably tend to convert free into absolute governments, so that's the bad narrative, right? That's decline and fall from free to absolute governments, there are, fortunately, others which tend by a process equally certain to reestablish the dignity and rights of human nature. Among these last, the most important by far, is the light of literature, widely diffused and with increasing splendor by the invention of printing. Literature, by enlightening the understanding and uniting the sentiments and views of men and nations, forms a concert of wills and a concurrence of action too powerful for the armies of tyrants. Three decades later, William Hazlitt, in an essay, The Influence of Books, would offer an even more melodramatic version of this. He likens uh, the printing press literally to a battering ram that smashes through the, the walls of the dark castle of feudal tyranny and, and lets the, the sort of sunshine of democratic progress come flooding in. The problem is that almost because of the elevated nature of these claims that are made for literature, uh, this narrative of literature as an engine of progress of whatever kind uh, tends to circulate alongside a counter narrative which says exactly the opposite. That literature is part of the problem, not the solution. That it's uh, hopelessly infected with the corruption, the excess, the silliness, the distraction, the superficiality of the age. Uh, and this uh, undertow of anxiety, 
uh, ha exists in every era in the changing technologies of writing. Juvenal's satires on ancient Rome has sort of a scorching satire in the degenerate state of Roman letters, which he sees as bound up with the corruption of gener life generally. Uh, even earlier and even more fundamentally, Socrates says, you know, writing is, is not an aid to memory, it's a crutch which weakens our ability for memory. Sort of like, you know, uh, the argument about should we allow kids to use calculators before they can get their times tables right? And the answer is no, we shouldn't. But uh, his point is that writing's doing the same thing. It's not something that makes us more human. It, it undermines us in lots of ways. By the 18th century, which is the period uh, that I work in, uh, these concerns are inflected with recognizably modern anxieties, not just about the commercialization of literature, the fact that it's part of a trade or a business, but the impact of Britain's consumer revolution uh, generally. And, and what all these anxieties turn on is not the neglect of literature, but quite the opposite, that it has become so popular. Reading and writing has become so popular in this kind of hopelessly uh, fashionable world. They all turn in one way or another on what a periodical called the Trifler called the epidemical madness for letters. The epidemical madness. It's an epidemic, a contagious, widespread, out of control disease. Uh, in 1714, the Spectator, which is one of the um, uh, most uh, distinguished, probably easily, I guess, the most distinguished periodical in the, in the, in the period, both uh, most popular and most respected, warned of what it called a certain distemper, the cacoethus scribendi, which is a hard word for a disease called, in plain English, the itch of writing. This cacoethus is as epidemical as the smallpox, there being very few who are not seized with it sometime or other in their lives. There is, however, this difference between these two distempers, that the first, after having indisposed you for a time, uh, never returns again. Whereas this I am speaking of, the itch of writing, once it has got into the blood, seldom comes out of it. The British nation is very much afflicted with this malady. And though very many remedies have been applied to persons infected with it, few of them have ever proved successful. If you have a patient of this kind under your care, you may assure yourself there is no other way of re recovering him effectually but by forbidding him the use of pen, ink, and paper. Uh, and you get this kind of laughs about the cacoethus scribendi all the way through. Also the cacoethus edendi, the itch of editing and the itch of criticism and so on. Uh, but another example from uh, 1781, so the sort of the, the, the late end of the century, uh, in a review of, a, of an utterly forgettable 22-page poem called A Letter from Betty to Sally with the Answer, the critical review warned that, quote, the cacoethus scribendi uh, is as epidemical a disease as any other kind of itch can possibly be. It never was, perhaps, more rife than in the present age, when every scribbler, however ignorant, illiterate, and totally incapable, takes up the pen and boldly ventures into the press without dread or shame. Uh, when I what I do mostly as a literary historian really is just uh, is eavesdrop. It's just listen in on the kinds of debates that are going on in, the, in this period amongst people who are addressing questions about what literature should be and how it should be part of their world, their modern world. Uh, and uh, I, it, it, my approach tends to be... Uh, like I think a lot of people here, my approach is, is sort of double-edged. I'm most interested in those historical debates that seem to resonate with debates that we're having in our own period. Uh, and partly I think that is strategic, that my wager in all of this is that we can better understand debates today uh, and better intervene in those debates, more effectively intervene in those debates if we understand the long history that's produced them. Uh, I think that is uh, especially true of my, my, my current uh, book project, which is uh, Imagining What We Know, A Defense of the Humanities in a Utilitarian Age. Uh, it takes a starting point from Martha Nussbaum's and everybody else's observation, but this is Martha Nussbaum that, quote, we are in the midst of a crisis of massive proportions and grave global significance. 
not the global economic crisis that began in 2008, though that context is definitely part of the issue, but the widespread erosion and almost distrust of the humanities in uh, teaching and research, in, uh, in the media, in governments, the struggle to protect funding for, for research and so on. And, and what's chilling, I think, is precisely how accurately that subtitle speaks to both the early 19th century and the early 21st centuries, a defense of the humanitarians, of the humanities in the utilitarian age. Uh, Thomas Love Peacock, who had been a, a poet himself, um, and, and it becomes a kind of convert to utilitarianism, which is the movement in the period, and it's really important, because it's the movement that's dominant in some ways in the early 19th century, which is the decades that the humanities emerge as the, in their modern disciplinary form in the, in the way that we think of the humanities today. Uh, and and they, they really are produced by a lot of people who see the humanities as a crucial part of the struggle for social progress. People like uh, Hazlitt and Leyhunt and Shelley and, and so on. Uh, but the, the, they're, in some ways their main rivals are the utilitarians. And they're important because they're, they're not reactionary you know, curmudgeons. They, they're, the, they're serious reformers, and they're intervening, and they want to, they, they'll change anything if they think it'll make society better, and they have a profound distrust of the humanities. They think it, it, it misses the mark, and what's interesting is how effective, and I think how insightful the arguments of the people who were making the case were for the humanities in the context of, of those sorts of uh, reactions. Uh, Thomas Love Peacock, who had become a convert to utilitarianism, denounced uh, the poet as what he called a waster of his own time and a robber of that of others. And he contrasted this to the, 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 the tendency of what he called the thinking and studious and scientific and philosophical part of the community, who draw on what he called the materials of useful knowledge in order to prepare oneself for the real business of life. So you have these good guys who draw on the materials of useful knowledge to prepare oneself for the real business of life, and then you have the misguided poets. Uh, and what I think is absolutely crucial is the ways in which that the, the poets and the art advocates of the humanities were forced to engage with these arguments at the moment when the humanities were emerging into their modern form. And Shelley, it, Shelley's Defense of Poetry is where I, I take the first part of my title, uh, Imagining What We Know. He says that, the, that poetry, but generally the humanities, produces a kind of higher form of knowledge, a kind of self-reflexive space for critical thinking, which enables us to imagine what we know, which enables us to situate applied forms of knowledge or instrumental knowledge within the larger context that might not otherwise be apparent, within what he calls the apprehend, unapprehended relations, which have so much to do with the way these things actually play out and, and, and the way they impact the lived experiences of, of men and women. So that project is what I'm working on now, but what I, what I wanted to do today was to, is to return to the book that just came out last year, which is the ways in which sort of related, it's the ways in which people in the period were adapting to a sense of incredible change, technological change, information overload, change of all kinds. And, uh, and, and not just that, but the way they were adapting to a kind of double level or meta form of change. They were adapting to a sense that Britain, for the very first time, had emerged into a society where change was the essence of that society. Until then, it had defined itself in terms of tradition and in terms of custom. Suddenly, in this kind of modern commercial world, driven by what one critic called the itch of novelty, just the, the, the need for novelty, and other critics called the tyranny of fashion. Uh, and they meant fashion in its, in its, its sort of average modern sense today. Uh, that, that this sense of relentless change had become the, the norm for the period. And how, what interests me is the ways that people responded to that. But Casimus Knox, a critic in the period, warned that, quote, no kind of writing in the present age is peculiarly fit for making a fortune. If you want to make your fortune, don't become a writer. I, I, everything's changed since then, obviously. But uh, uh, auctioneers, dancing masters, quack doctors, dentists, balloonists, actresses, opera dancers, equestrian performers, perfumers, these are they whom the British nation either honors with fame or rewards with affluence. So as, as Kim said in the introduction, my work really was, what I became interested in is the ways that writers offered up 
really interesting responses to the kind of questions that come out of that. Questions about, as Kim said, you know, what kind of writing matters in this sort of, you know, thriving commercial nation? What kind of knowledge should it offer? What should the role of the, of the author be? And how are these questions bound up with broader questions about changing nature of the reading public? Uh, and what I was really struck by and found utter, you know, extremely compelling was a whole set of answers that I started getting as I was reading through a bunch of the stuff in the period from a lot of critics who are arguing for what I want to call an aesthetic of immersion. They're, not, uh, they're neither idealizing the period and they're not giving in to kind of a, a, I think a too easy kind of you know, nostalgia for some older, better time before it all went to hell. They're, they are engaged with the period, but they're doing it by celebrating an aesthetic of immersion. They, 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 uh, it's based, it begins with a very frank acknowledgement of their location within what Michel de Certeau has called the oceanic rumble of everyday life. They're part of the oceanic rumble of everyday life, as opposed to a kind of an aesthetic of transcendence, the idea that somehow art is above or transcends the mundane realities of everyday life, uh, or what William Cooper called the more than mortal height of the poet. So they're celebrating an aesthetic of transcendence, and they're doing it in a way which is pushing off, I think, against two things. On the one hand, against the sort of a kind of self-importance of a kind of enlightenment rationalism with its commitment to the fusion of knowledge. They're part of that movement, actually. They, they have sympathy with it, but they're kind of pushing off against that and against the kind of, I think, the self-aggrandizing idea of the kind of the romantic genius, you know, who's sort of wrestling with the burden of his, of his inspiration on a mountain somewhere. Uh, and they're celebrating instead what someone in the period, so John Hawkins calls that lower kind of literature which required vernacular erudition. That lower kind of literature which required vernacular erudition. It's a wonderful phrase, vernacular erudition. They're celebrating the importance of being able to write about things that matter to a lot of people across the spectrum in ways that is clear and compelling. Vernacular erudition. To be able to speak in the everyday language of people around them. I think that remains a more important uh, goal than ever, and I think it's one that we abandon at our enormous peril. Playing on its own title, a periodical called The Microcosm coined the phrase microcosmopolitan to suggest this double emphasis on both an aesthetic of immersion rather than transcendence and its focus on the minutiae of daily life rather than the great events of nations or famous individuals. And, and Samuel Johnson, who, who I'd started off thinking of as sort of this pompous, you know, bombastic Dr. Johnson, which is how he's remembered too often in literary history, was actually one of the great and wonderful surprises for me of this project because he's engaging throughout his periodical writing in a very sympathetic and extremely generous uh, attempt to intervene and to make exactly the same case, the need for this sort of vernacular erudition, as Sir John Hawkins put it. Johnson writes about the importance of writing in ways that is, well, as he puts it, leveled with the general surface of life. Writing in ways that is leveled with the general surface of life. Not writing about what he says, you know, he says, Stuff about great men and generals and things like that, that's like the fairy regions, is his phrase. It's the fairy regions for most people. We should write about things that people can relate to. Uh, and for Johnson and for so many others, this leveling spirit, uh, level with the general surface of life, this, this extended from the material itself to a focus on, on what should be the, the worldliness of the authors themselves. Johnson objects again and again to the arrogance, the self-defeating arrogance of what he sees as scholars some scholars' tendency to look on the common business of the world with disdain and their unwillingness, as he puts it, to condescend to learn what is not to be found in any system of philosophy. These people who won't learn something unless it's part of a kind of exclusive theoretical or philosophical vocabulary, for him that is uh, utterly self-defeating. In the same vein, David Hume denounced, and he said this is more true of the previous age, and luckily for him, he thinks things have changed for the better. But he denounced the idea of learning, as he put it, shut up in colleges and cells and secluded from the world and good company as what he calls a moping, recluse method of study. And for Hume, it's not just pointless, it's self-defeating, because too much of that existence is going to leave you with nothing to write about. He says, what could be expected from men who never consulted experience in any of their reasonings? or who never search for that experience where alone it's to be found, in common life and conversation. They both use the variation on that theme, common life 
Uh, and they mean a couple things, Brian. It's really important to get that double emphasis. One thing is the ordinary life of everyday people, but also common life, a focus on life which, which you know, puts a premium on the importance of our commonality with other people, that we live in common with others, we share things in common. And what he wants to emphasize, is, they both want to emphasize, is the need for authors to live in ways which emphasize that common life, if they want to have anything productive to say. This, uh, this focus on, uh, this kind of leveling focus and this emphasis on common life is, is doubled by a sort of, um, a kind of a, a focus on the circulation of the texts themselves, the way in which their actual periodicals and miscellaneous writing are actually circulating within what the, the connoisseur, a periodical called the connoisseur, called the wider theater of the world. Uh, so this is really where I think they're closest and really part of that whole uh, emphasis, the Enlightenment emphasis on a kind of diffusion of knowledge, but they do it in a kind of self-ironic way, a kind of tongue-in-cheek way which sort of uh, prevents them from sounding too self-seriousness. And one crucial element of the way they do it is through their use of, of, uh, of sort of pseudonymous, they're fictional characters, but the edi editor or the narrator of these periodicals. So for the connoisseur, it's Mr. Town. For uh, the world, it's the utterly vain and deluded Adam Fitzadam who goes on about great length about how he will be uh, interned in Westminster Abbey in Poets' Corner when he's dead and, and so on. Uh, but, they're, but they're also serious about the importance of these circulated texts. So it's, it's sort of tongue in cheek, but it's not. <laughs> Reflecting on the side of his periodicals, quote, uh, strung upon a file and swelling gradually into a little volume in the public coffee houses. So Mr. Town has this essay where he goes around from coffee house to coffee house out of sheer vanity just to see people reading his, his periodical. And it's a way of sort of being self-ironic rather than self-aggrandizing. But they're also serious about the underlying point. He announced, quote, and this is on the screen, I have considered every speck of dirt as a mark of reputation and have assumed to myself applause from the spilling of coffee or the print of a greasy thumb. In a word, I look upon each paper when torn and sullied by frequent handling as an old soldier battered in the service and covered with honorable scars. So circulation counts more than collection. Handling is more important than sort of some kind of pristine display. Uh, in a related example in the world, uh, Adam Fitzadam, the, the editor, says, the better to take my measure for the future. So the, the better to take my measure for the future, to see how posterity will remember me. He has endeavored to trace the progress of my, this will come, I'll get to the quote in a second, but I've endeavored to trace the progress and reception of my paper through the several classes of his readers. Uh, and so he has a thing where it's introduced to a great house, sort of the Downton Abbey kind of house, and first re where it's first received by the porter, who yawning just casts his half eye, open eyes upon it, from thence gives it to the maid, Mrs. Betsy, who, who looks at it for about two seconds and, and throws it aside for the daily advertiser, which, where she really what she wants to see is the personal columns. Uh, and it goes on on its way up. And he then, uh, the world then, uh, the essay goes on to chart the world's pathways through society, including where it's being read by families of an inferior class, as he puts it, who are the only people who actually read it with any kind of care and rigor, uh, before it arrives at its ultimate destination. I must confess that the present fashion of curling the hair has proved exceedingly favorable to me. Uh, and perhaps the quality of my paper, as it happens to be peculiarly adapted to that purpose, may contribute more than its merit to the sale of it. A head that has taken a right French turn requires, as I'm assured, four score curls in distinct papers. And those curls must be renewed as often as the head is combed, which is perhaps once a month. Four of my papers are sufficient for that purpose, an amount only to eight pence, which is very little more than what the same quantity of plain paper would cost. Taking it, therefore, altogether, it seems not inconsistent with good economy to purchase it at so small a price. This reflection might mortify me as an author. But on the other hand, self-love, which is ingenious in availing itself of the slightest favorable circumstances, comforts me with the thought that of the prodigious number of daily and weekly papers that are now published, mine is perhaps the only one that is ultimately applied to the head. <laughs> so this kind of wonderful parodic tone enables it to have it both ways. On one hand, they're aligning themselves with the, uh, you know, this uh, belief, which they, they did hold in the diffusion of knowledge and things getting around. Uh, 
but it also allows them to not just, it kind of introduces a note of humility and humor, but it, it, it highlights their acknowledgement of their own complicity with this world that they're criticizing. They may be, and they usually are, fairly critical of this modern commercial world, but they're being honest about the fact they're part of it. They're not somehow pretending to criticize the world around them from some kind of ideologically pure external spot. They're part of this world. And so that sense of complicity is crucial. But I think it's, uh, it's even more important because it's part of, of what, I, what I think the periodicals and the miscellaneous writing that I, I've been looking at were up to. And that's something I think far more ambitious, not necessarily more important, but far more ambitious than uh, than these emphasis on vernacular erudition and, and writing in ways that's level with the general surface of life. As important as that is, they're interested in producing a different relation to knowledge. A different relation to knowledge that's bound up with their own material reality as these one-off periodicals and miscellaneous writings and so on. And, and they want to, to articulate an idea about knowledge in ways that is particularly consistent with the demands of a thriving commercial nation. They're constantly highlighting the issue of the sociology of their reading audiences, who's reading it, whose hands it's getting into. But they're also raising the more radical question of the status of knowledge itself. They're embracing an ironic mode which aligns their efforts with the enlightenment faith in this reformist power of the diffusion of knowledge. And they're unsettling the, un the availability of this sort of knowledge in any stable or easily consolidated form. And this is really important because of the ways in which it resonates with larger concerns about commerce in the period. This is an age of ideological consolidation. It's the age of the wealth of nations, the age when people begin to accept a kind of almost providential logic for commerce, the invisible hand that is actually uh, uh, organized around a sense of equilibrium and that there's something uh, natural about it and therefore okay about it. It's an age where that is the perspective that is beginning to dominate. But there remain profound concerns. Uh, and the most obvious one from the beginning of the century is that for the first time Britain's organized, as, you know, it's organized around a system which caters to greed. And so you have this enormous uh, ideological effort to distinguish between greed, which is bad, and, and healthy self-interest, which is good, uh, in the works of people like Hume and Smith and so on. Um, another concern that seems to really bother pe people even more is just the ways in which this modern commercial world encourages just this sense of vulgarity, this crass, nouveau riche taste, this love of novelty for the sake of novelty, and all the things that are most horrible about it. But what seems most fundamentally to be even more disturbing for a lot of people is the sense of enormous contingency that characterizes this sort of modern commercial world. The sense that in a transactional market society, value has come untethered from any kind of foundational, stable, intrinsic sense of, of worth. That value now sort of floats on the free tides of buying and selling, supply and demand, and it's unpredictable and often unwarranted, and it's bound up in, in simply sort of the desires, the passions, the fears, the guesswork of, of all kinds of people, all of whom are trying to outguess each other and, and, and none of whom know each other. And it's, it produces this sense of extraordinary instability. There's a, a wonderful um, economic treatise in the period where someone who's trying to defend the use of paper money, which is still causing concern because it has no intrinsic value, it's purely symbolic. And he says, you know, he doesn't try to calm people down. He says, you know, the great thing is that's our world. We're like paper money. Then nothing has intrinsic value anymore. It's all about supply and demand. It's always constantly in change and it's not foundational anymore. And this is, is, is a cause of great concern for people. Uh, one of the most illustrious uh, historians, cultural and intellectual historians of this period, J.G.A. Pocock, uh, argues that once people had accepted the realities of this kind of modern economy based on these endless processes of exchange and guesswork between strangers, uh, then people, as he puts it, quote, were doomed to inhabit a world more unstable in its epistemological foundations than Plato's cave. If you live in that kind of world, you live in a world more unstable in its epistemological foundations than Plato's cave. And so my, uh, I think the question at the heart of that project was what did all of that have to do with literature? Or more importantly, to turn that around, what did writers do with all of this? 
Uh, how did they forge a set of answers to those questions about why that literature mattered that spoke to those kinds of concerns? Uh, and my argument is that their response was bound up with this double gesture that I've been describing. Simultaneously contributing to the diffusion of knowledge uh, and calling into question the status of knowledge in a modern commercial world. And the easiest way to see this is a preface that Samuel Johnson writes to a book, a fairly uh, um, forgettable book, Richard Rolt's Dictionary of Trade and Commerce. It's sort of a handbook style encyclopedia. Uh, Samuel Johnson never meets Richard Rolfe. He has no interest in it. He's hired by the booksellers to write a preface because they know that it will give it credibility and boost its sales. And, and, uh, and what Samuel Johnson, however, says in the introduction to this book is uh, that it's impossible. You can't do it. You can't write an encyclopedia of commerce. Commerce, by its very nature, is too... Uh, unstable, too, uh, too contingent, too endlessly dissolving to, uh, to, be, to make itself available to any kind of stable, classificatory knowledge. As uh, Johnson puts it in the preface to this encyclopedia, a volume intended to contain whatever is requisite to be known by every trader necessarily becomes so miscellaneous and unconnected as not to be easily reducible to heads. The kind of knowledge that you would have to put in an encyclopedia of commerce is so quickly becomes so miscellaneous and unconnected as not to be reducible to heads, not to be you put into an encyclopedia format. But the people who respond to that, and Johnson's one of them, uh, that's where they see the importance of literature. They say, you know what? That's us. We're writing in ways which is thoroughly miscellaneous and unconnected. And they celebrate it again and again and again. The fact that they're writing these one-off periodicals. They say, I never know what I'm going to write until I sit down to write. And what I write in my next one will be something completely different. And Johnson uh, has this wonderful periodical called The Idler. And, and The Idler is the editor. And he says, you know, I just write anything because I'm so lazy. And, uh, and they, one, another person says, it's all a patchwork. And, you know, it's all clearly tongue-in-cheek. They're, they're proud of their work. But what they're saying is that they are producing a form of literature that is as miscellaneous and unconnected as the world around them. So if you want to understand the world around them, you go to this kind of writing. And, and therefore, what they're doing is embodying in their material form, because they're being, you know, they're being produced every week or twice a week, or some of them even daily, or their miscellaneous writings and so on. Uh, they're producing in their material form a kind of knowledge which is sort of self-deconstructive, which is miscellaneous and unconnected, and which, which sees itself as having something particularly useful to say as a result of that. And, and in doing so, what they produce is what uh, Ina Ferris has called an ethic of reading. An ethic of reading which forces people to negotiate these kinds of complexities as a way of training them to be part of a modern world. And it's important because on one level, what they're also doing is highlighting the significance of the relationship between their content, the ideas that they're conveying, and their material reality as these sort of endless one-off texts. Uh, and I think that goes a long way to answering, uh, on a side note, sort of one of the questions which has really bedeviled book history, which is one of the main kind of new innovations in a lot of humanities departments, including English. And what book historians said, and rightly so, is that we've been way too quick to ignore the physical reality of the books that people saw writing in and just make the leap into kind of the abstract, you know, sort of evanescent quality of the ideas themselves. Uh, and that we need to get back to the physical objects that mediated people's perception of this writing. Uh, and that is absolutely right, but too often, in some hands, book history is the pendulum just swung the other way, and it's sort of a facts rule or empirical study of the exact nature of how books were made, how they were bound, and so on, the kind of factual details which don't explain why literature mattered to so many people and why they're so passionate about it and so anxious about it at the same time. But these periodicals and these writers are answering that because they're highlighting the productive tension between both of those, between the ideas and their material reality as things which are miscellaneous and unconnected. They uh, e exemplify uh, one really interesting, I think, book historian critic, Ch Roger Chartier's comment about the importance of staying attuned to what he calls the space between text and object, the space between the abstract ideas and the object, the book itself, which is precisely the space in which meaning is constructed. And that's their point again and again.
in acknowledging their own complicity with these things. Uh, but I think what they're also saying is that space between text and object uh, can also be a, a perilous one. Recasting both the ideal that literary genius somehow transcended everyday life and the enlightenment goal of the diffusion of knowledge in, in typically parodic terms, Mr. Town, the editor of The Connoisseur, indulged in the familiar wish, quote, that I could accompany my papers wheresoever they are circulated through all their travels and mutations, from the company of the politest men of quality in the closets of our finest ladies to the shame of seeing many of them prostituted to the vilest purposes. If in one place, I might be pleased to find them the entertainment of the tea table. In another, I should be no less vexed to see them degraded to the base office of sticking up candles. The account's proliferating list of the usual vile uses that everybody complained of at the hands of pastry cooks who use you know, sheets of type uh, to wrap sweetmeats and so on, and trunk makers who use them to line trunks, culminated in an accident, in an account of, quote, an accident which happened to me the other evening as I was walking in some field near the town. As I went along, my curiosity tempted me to examine the materials of which several paper kites were made up. He sees this whole field of kids. I mean, it's fiction, right? But he sees this whole field of kids flying kites that they've made of sort of tearing these pages and pasting them together to make kites. From whence I had sufficient room to moralize on the ill fate of authors. On one, I discovered several pages of a sermon expanded over the surface. On another, the wings fluttered with love songs. And a satire on the ministry or the government furnished another with ballast for the tale. I at length happened to cast my eye on one taller than the rest and beheld several of my own darling productions pasted over it. He sees this kite made up of the connoisseur. Having conquered his initial indignation at having, be, quote, become the plaything of children, Mr. Town managed to convert what at first seemed a disgrace into a compliment to my vanity by recasting the possibility of distinction in terms which reflected the realities of modern fame. As the kite rose into the air, I drew a flattering parallel between the height of its flight and the soaring of my own reputation. I imagined myself lifted up on the wings of fame, and like Horace's swan, towering above mortality. I fancied myself born like a blazing star among the clouds to the admiration of the gazing multitude. But whatever his momentary susceptibility to the lure of transcendence, even in this modified form, the connoisseur's account ultimately aligned itself with a version of literature which opted for immersion rather than distance. In his, quote, fantastic contemplation of my own excellence, he conceded, he had ignored the true lesson afforded by the scene. I never considered by how slight a thread my chimerical importance was supported. The twine broke, <laughs> and the kite, together with my airy dreams of immortality, dropped to the ground. Yet another literary calamity. Another harbinger of the dangers of the sense of materiality as a symbol of contingency rather than stability. Though like the sight of that other periodical, the world, circulating as hair curlers, it could at least be recycled as the stuff of new writing, designed, however ironically, to prove that we are human. Thank you.